All right. Hello, Peter. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. It's great to have you on the show today, the Business Exclusive. Um, today, of course, we'll be talking about family businesses. Uh, we're talking earlier about how family businesses last year actually outperformed um, non-family businesses. And, you know, I found that quite interesting. So, um, family, you have a wealth of experience, um, even going back uh, to, at your time at um, EY, you know, in terms of advising and helping family businesses. And now you're the global family business leader at PwC. So my first question is, uh, what would you say are the unique factors that are responsible for the success of family businesses and how can you know, African and Nigerian family businesses learn from, from these uh, examples that you will be sharing? So family business has uh, typically uh, two uh, enormous advantages over the corporate and listed peers. One is that they have a really this long-term perspective. They are thinking really long-term because they want to keep the business for succeeding generations. And the second uh, is that they are really entrepreneurs by heart. Yeah, they want to find solutions and they never give up to find a solution until they get it. And uh, this persistence, this, uh, this reliability, persistence, and the ethos that most of the family business has even codified in values makes them really unique. So what are the, ex so you've talked now about um, you know, the skills that these family businesses have that more or less stands them in good stead you know, compared, again, uh, compared to non-family businesses. But going further, what exactly do you, do you think is key you know, for um, family businesses? Like what is that defining factor that is behind the growth, the immense growth in family businesses that we're seeing today? A family business has a unique um, challenge also, in fact. It's not only, um, only a positive things, they have also a pressure. You know, you know, if the family grows, there is a growth mandate to grow the business at the same speed as the family grows in order to avoid that wealth and the family well-being is being diluted uh, in each generation. So they have a mandate, an imperative to grow. How to do that? Uh, family businesses are typically held in a private setting, so they have limited access to the capital market. This is why they have to be very, very careful how they allocate resources and how they innovate. Many of them are pioneering new technologies and they test it in their own small environment before they make it really big. So they are conscious innovators and conscious adopters become much more effective yes, if they... It's if, if they take a decision. Mm. So what, what would you say, uh, I mean, what family business um, structures, ownership structures can be utilized by African families drawing on the global landscape to ensure asset protection as well as wealth preservation? This is a very tricky question. So this goes uh, with uh, a discussion in different direction. One is the chosen, chosen legal form that you choose. And uh, the other one is in which uh, country and which legal environment you want to establish, let's say, your holding company. So, and this can be in two different locations. You can have your operating company in one country, your holding structure and ownership, so to say, in the different countries. Based on the fact that in countries uh, with low level of trust in, um, in your business partners, in the stability and the long-term perspective, so there is a tendency that we see in many countries, not only in Africa, that uh, trust structures uh, became popular again. I would say there is a renaissance of trust structures currently. Mm. Good. I mean, you allude, alluded earlier to the fact that there are some challenges that um, family businesses face you know, around the world. Are, are these challenges unique to only um, the developed markets, or do you see the same patterns in African family businesses as well? And how do you think they can you know, address those challenges? I think the challenges are pretty much the same. Uh, as, uh, so it really depends whether you are more a local domestic family-owned business or whether you are a global international player in the market. You know, the current given uh, macroeconomic environment with a lot of instability, with geopolitical challenges, it's hard to navigate. And especially it's hard to take long-term decision in terms of investments, for instance, in which country to invest what. And this is why we see that um, family businesses respond to this challenge by uh, starting very early to review their, so their entire supply chain. And as a result, we see that some family businesses acted very fast in restructuring part of their supply chain, moving from external to internal sourcing, 
and uh, combining local sourcing within the country with international global reach. So this has been different in the past when the only guiding principle was how to get cheapest access to resources mm. and materials. Now other factors came into come to play. play. Mm. Times are changing, really. So yeah, I mean, over the next decade, um, quite a number of Nigerian and African businesses would be you know, passing on their business to the next uh, generation. Yeah. From your experience, um, you know, we know succession planning is a big problem in Nigeria. But what, what, what would you say is the global best practice and how can you know, Nigerian and African businesses really get it right in terms of you know, having the right succession plan in place? I think one thing that I strongly recommend is to think beyond management succession. Not only focusing who is the best talent out of my family pool that can run the operations in a leadership position going forward. For family members, they have different options to get involved as an owner, as a competent board member, or as a visionary leader. But don't limit yourself to the thinking about what is the continuation in the leadership of the, of the business. A success recipe that we see uh, is really um, universal in all parts of the world, that you start really with codifying what makes us unique as a family. What are our core values as a family and how does this relate with the business activities? How does this translate into the codex and the mission and the purpose for running the business? In order to really define your license to operate as a business and to be clear on your values. Unfortunately, only 40% of global family businesses and even less in Africa have codified their values and their mission. But this is an imperative if you want to attract and retain the best talent, which is a fundamental need for growth. If you want to build trust in society and with business partners, and trust is, is what you want to get. Trust amongst family members to have the full support for the business, trust amongst employees and the management to drive the business with the best capable talent, and also trust uh, with other business partners and investors that they can trust what you are doing. So codify your values, start with this one. By doing so, it will flow very naturally that you think about, oh, we haven't talked about what is important for you, chairman, dad, mother. What are your intentions? Something which has not been addressed and discussed amongst the family yet will come up during this discussion around values, purpose, and mission. And this is a good start. Based on my experience and on my recent discussion with business owners here in Nigeria, so I would tend to compare, not similar, but I want, tend to compare the attitude that yeah. we find here in Nigeria with those of ethnic Chinese families. In Asia, which means you have a lot of respect for the elderly, you have a lot of respect, and you don't dare to ask for succession because this means I want you to die, and this is <laughs> completely disrespectful. Precisely. You never do that. But what you can do is that you can start, hey, grandfather, hey, father, so we would love to hear the stories, how everything began. Can we start to learn from you? So, what are the key takeaways, and what do you want us? to take as a lesson learned and what you want us to transmit to the next generation. And then things come naturally up and say, I want the best for my family. I want that everybody is taken care of, but we have the business as the center of our wealth and it's my baby, I founded this and I would like to keep this in good hands. And then it's much easier if you have a different starting point, a non-confronting, a non-offensive starting point for the discussion, building on the great history, the values, starting with some pictures from the past, how mom and dad started something. Or, so this is non-offensive. And then you get gradually there to say, okay, what shall we do with family members not showing interest in the business? How could we select family members for leadership position? Because it's, it's for a higher good. It's for a higher good for the family. But we need to know what you, chairman, think is a good process because one day you are not around anymore and can decide and make your judgment. So, and then we want to avoid that we are argue amongst ourselves, give us guidance, we need the guidance. And a very recent accident that happened over the weekend with a Nigerian businessman in the US with a helicopter crash has reminded many of the families here that, that you cannot predict the future. And uh, in the recent discussions that I had, very so for, for many families, this came as, as a wake-up call to say, oh my goodness, what will happen if something happened to the chairman? 
And I think these are good discussions to have. Yeah. But, but I would not recommend, this is what you can do in Germany, this can, can, in, in, can do in the UK, in the US, in the more Western educated world. It's appropriate to ask your father for succession or your mother and saying, what is your plan? I need to know this. I want to build my own future. But in your environment, this is not appropriate. Yeah. To know that. I mean, you got that right for sure. Sometimes if you ask Nigerian business owners about their um, plans for succession, they look at you like, you want me dead. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you're right, exactly. you're right, you're right. Um, I'll, I'll let my colleague ask a few questions as well now. All right, so I will just speak from where, where you stopped. These success recipes that you shared. So, of course, there are different... Asian uh, business environment is different from the African business environment. So I want to ask, is this a one-size-fits-all uh, solution? The success recipes that you mentioned for family businesses. There are no one-size-fits-all because every family is different, every family dynamic is different, every business is different, every cultural background is different. The challenges are always the same, uh, but the solution is different. And even within a country, it varies from family to family. What I strongly suggest based on my uh, more than 30 years of experience to follow a very structured approach starting with the easy things that you can agree on okay. values, so mission, purpose before you get to the, to the difficult ones never start with the difficult ones because then you can always go back when you talk about why you choose my sister over my brother, uh, why how have we limited access to dividends we want or we need it for our children, for our lifestyle or whatever. Uh, why should we come back if we have studied uh, abroad and we don't want to come back? All this question can be much easier addressed if you have consensus on the main foundational elements of the family like values, mission, cohesion and mission. All right, thank you for sharing that stepping stone. So the next question I want to ask is, how has the family office landscape evolved globally in recent years? And then what significant role does the family office play in wealth preservation and sustaining the family legacy? It's a very good question. So uh, family offices became more popular in the sense of managing family wealth and family investment separate from the business. So we're talking about single family offices, not that the existing holding company uh, takes over a certain uh, role in doing some investment, private investment for the family. So we're talking about single family offices really managing separate from the business the wealth of the family and taking care to keep them out of trouble. <clears throat> Those family businesses has, uh, uh, sorry, this family offices has grown tremendously. Uh, the number of single family offices doubled over the last 10 years. If you see a recent development, so it's a part of the asset protection it's part of risk diversification that many entrepreneurs, not only in Africa, the same accounts for, uh, for Asia and this same accounts also for some countries in Europe that they say, uh, where should I locate my family office? How to move some assets or some wealth management out of the country? Not being dependent with my family wealth from one place to be or one person to manage it. So it's a huge, tremendous trend towards single family offices. As I mentioned, number has doubled, and there is also a kind of race for a kind of beauty contest. Yeah, so Singapore has started a big initiative, right, with a big support of the development agency and with governmental support, leading to the application of 3,000 more single-family offices over the last two years in Singapore. Wow. You can imagine that the lack 3, of talent, 3,000. So, and you can imagine that the lack of talent in Singapore will lead also to one day, so many of those going to Singapore for wealth management purposes, but also having a permanent residency or a passport or something like that, or so some benefits which comes with being there. Um, but it's hard to find a good and qualified people. The other com contestant is uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, together with a typical suspect like US, UK, uh, Switzerland, and so on. So uh, the next question I want to ask is about the trends that you've noticed. I think iPhone have noticed a lot of family offices prefer UK and Singapore, as you mentioned. But in your 30 years experience, what global trends are you seeing in sustainable and impact investing, uh, impact investing adoption among family offices? Another very good question. So impact investing is a natural evolution of philanthropy and giving back. So uh, with the realization that it's more effective to change the system and to fight the root cause instead of healing symptoms by donating uh, money or food or whatever to society, 
there was a big uh, big uh, focus on impact investing. So this field is pretty new. So at the beginning, nobody knew exactly what impact investing really is and uh, how to do it. In the meantime, the sector has developed significantly. You have still black sheep selling something as impact investing, which is a normal, very normal stock uh, uh, stock uh, election from some listed companies. It's not what we typically believe impact investing is. It becomes more relevant has the amount of the strategic asset allocation within a family office dramatically increased towards impact investing and philanthropy? I would say no. So it has been just shifted from more philanthropic to impact investing. But we see some other trends. So 40% of all startups in the world are funded by family offices and family businesses globally, so which make families uh, the most active investors in technology and startup companies. This is their way in order to participate in future technology and in future development because many cannot apply technology like Gen AI or others in the existing business models very easily. And this is why they start separate uh, family venturing and investment. Okay, I agree that you mentioned <laughs> uh, startups and uh, tech uh, pr- uh, platforms because that is the foundation for this question, which is what's, what is the growing appetite for alternative investments like cryptocurrency, private equity, venture capital, real estate among family offices globally? And then how does this, how does this compare to traditional public market investments? I think real estate has always been a significant part of the portfolio investment, but uh, I think the direct investment play a significant part and also equities play a significant part. So other alternatives like private equity, hedge funds, crypto, as you mentioned, due to the hype of crypto two or three years ago and a lot of lost in value over the last two or three years, I think uh, family office became a little bit more conscious uh, with regard to the asset allocation towards crypto. They keep it, they hold it, they don't realize the losses so far, and I am pretty confident in the long run they will make good profits out of that. But currently it's not very popular. Private equity and hedge funds, yes, so still part of the portfolio, roughly about 5-6% of the total asset allocation typically, so not too much. And um, um, therefore I, w- I think it will continue to have their place. But the bigger trend we see is in direct investment in club deals with other families. This is what we really see is really taking off. What would you say are the key strategies um, you know, that you would recommend for family businesses that are trying to you know, get their, the next generation involved in their business? So next generation involvement is always a tricky task. My recommendation is... Uh, Show them in, in early years uh, what the business is all about. Don't be shy. Yeah. So if you don't know what you are... Lay it all on the table. Yeah, so lay it all on the table. Yeah. So at least what it means, what the business is doing, that you understand, oh, mom, dad, uncle, brother coming, coming, uh, coming home and talking about business, and I have no clue what this business is all about, whether we are in oil and gas, whether we are in transportation, whether we are producing foods for people. Show them, show them the, uh, uh, the company, show them the impact that you have on the life of others. These are our employees, this is Mr. Smith and this is Mrs. Mm. Uh, y and uh, uh, they are feeding their families with what mm. we do so that they get a sense of responsibility yeah. so that they do not see the business as a cash machine but as a responsibility that needs to be handled very carefully. Mm. At a certain age, not too early, uh, I also recommend to provide more transparency about their expect- what they may or may not expect as an owner, if they inherit shares, or as a beneficiary, if uh, the assets are in the trust structure and you get, uh, get uh, access um, uh, to funds and money from, from, from the trustee, just to manage expectation so that, that they know what to expect. This requires that you have your succession plan in place, yeah. which is often not the case, and then you don't know what to say. But I think based on my experience working with NextGen over the last 16 years across the world, is that they need to know what the, what the expectations of the parents are. They need to know how, at a certain age, uh, uh, what is the expectation and access to, to, to capital and funds so that they can digest and, uh, and adjust to this because um, what I always say is uh, wealth can become easily a poison gift. 
ending up to having false friends, leading to bad behavior. And uh, we have seen that uh, wealthy next gens who were not prepared become drug addicted, criminal, and didn't have any any any, yeah, any yeah. good uh, time Great. in life. So this doesn't make sense. Great. So it makes them familiar, brings them to the company, allow for internships so yeah. that they know what they own, but yeah. gives them the freedom to choose whether they want to be engaged or not. Yeah, yeah. So you get them young essentially. But you know, you, you, there was something you kept saying. You, you said at the right age. So at the right what age. is the right age? I think yeah, uh, uh, bringing them to the company and so, so this is what the company is doing. You, you can start very early, yeah? Age of 10 years or so, this is what you do. This is what we are doing here. They this is the production. So, sorry? They could come do internships at, your, at the office. So y internships, I would say internships or working on the floor and so on. So uh, not, not, not introducing child labor here. So yeah. <laughs> but they say maybe 15, 16 years old. So, but do an mm. internship. Uh, so that they understand how the business is working. So what different tasks exist at the shop floor for a blue collar worker, for those uh, working in the office, so, so that they start to get a sense of the complex system of the company. Great. So let me ask this question. I mean, in Nigeria today, um, we have economic growth challenges, right? And I mean, if I've heard you correctly, um, family businesses do play a very vital role. Yeah. You know, globally, in terms of contributing to economic growth, you said I mean, forty percent of investors and businesses are forty percent of investors in, in startup and scale startup globally is family businesses. Yeah. So, how important is it for Nigeria at this time? I mean, what what what's the um, what what's the main what's the huge gain in terms of you know helping family businesses in Nigeria really grow and thrive? What 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 gain would that have on how that translates to economic growth and as well as uh, you know fostering uh, development in, in Nigeria and across Africa as well. No, absolutely. So there's uh, strong evidence and we do an EMEA private business attractiveness index every year so that we were able to prove that there is a correlation, a very strong correlation between an enabling environment for private businesses to grow and to flourish and the GDP growth in the country and the public welfare of, an, of a society. There is undeniable and you look around the world, in all countries, there is no exception. Yeah. Private businesses drive economic growth, drive innovation, and drive also employment. The biggest advantage that family business have so far, also according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, is that they enjoy the highest level of trust of society, employees, and others. More than government, more than media, even more than NGOs. They are the most trusted and perceived most competent institution on the planet across all countries. What's important for Nigeria? I think a family business with codified values, with this clear mission, has a clear mandate to build or keep the level of trust with the broader stakeholder group, not only amongst the family members, but also with the workers, with the communities and others. I think what this is for me paramount and this is a foundation. Another element has to come on top, which is alignment with the government. You know, uh, the private sector and the government need to align towards common goals. What are the things that need to get done in this country? And what is the role of the government? Typically, it's setting the rules is describing this is the direction we want, but they're not the executors. The executors are the company, the inventors are the companies, so the realizer of new ideas are the companies. And the private sector is ready to contribute, but they need guidance and it needs alignment. And from my personal uh, perspective, I think restoring trust in this country is the fundamental number one issue to attract more investments and investors into the country. Precisely. Thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thank Likewise. You.